Hello, everybody, and welcome. Good morning. Um, so glad to be here with you after a little bit of a long hiatus. And, uh, you know, glad to be learning again with you. So this is Yisrael Levitt, and I'm here with Virtual Colo. And we are broadcasting here from beautiful Hudson, Wisconsin, and at Beth Emanuel Messianic Congregation. Um, so I wanted to just go ahead and talk a little bit about a word of introduction, uh, what we're going to be doing for the next uh, few weeks, for the next month or so, um, you know, uh, ending the month of the month of Sivan, um, going into the month of Tammuz, and then ultimately, obviously, into the month of Av. Um, so we'll be ending Sivan and we'll go into Tammuz, um, which uh, if I'm looking, yes, uh, the, the, uh, this Shabbat, the Shabbat, Shabbat Mavrachim, uh, Mavrachim, and uh, so meaning that um, Rosh Chodesh is next week. So anyways, uh, so we're getting into Rosh Chodesh Tammuz next week, and that's the month before Av. Now Av is the month that it says, Misha Nechnas Adar Marbim Simcha. When the month of Adar comes in, uh, we increase in joy, and it says that we decrease in the month of Av. We decrease joy. Now, why do we decrease joy? Um, because we have uh, the very, very sad, um, extremely uh, mournful day of Tisha B'Av, um, the ninth of Av on our calendar, which is the the commemoration of the date of the destruction of the temple number one and temple number two, and you know so many other historical events, which actually we'll talk about. You know, maybe one of them that's a little implicit, even before uh, the destruction of the first temple, um, at least in the in the midrash, and. Um, so in preparation for that day, if so so on that day we commemorate the destruction of the temple, uh, both temples, etc. And uh, we also are um, uh, reading the book of Echa. So Echa is um, the book of Lamentations. Um, how does it translate it into English from probably the Latin or something like that? And um, so Echa just means how. How could this happen? Is basically what the book is, um, you know, just that one word. Like, I mean, if you can imagine a book being written, you know, uh, a national book, if you will, you know, maybe something, you know, of the of the United States, you know, uh, being being written on 9/11, you know, or about 9/11, you know, called how, how could it have happened that this would this, uh, you know, this would have been the case. And so, anyways, I'm just looking at my phone to turn down the turn down the uh, the ringer ringer here. Um, so, anyways, so you know that's what the book's all about. Now, um, you might be asking, you know, why are we studying such a a, a sad book? Um, and in in fact, you know, I hope that this year we don't have to read the book of Echa. Why? Because we'll have redemption. We'll have uh, you know uh, a geula. And instead of, it says, you know, in the book of Zechariah, in the book of Zechariah, it talks about there's four fast days. And one of them being on the fast of the ninth of Av. And it says, it talks about the, um, it talks about the day as a moed, as a appointed time. But uh, but the, the sages play off of that and say that, oh, one day it actually will become a holiday. That, excuse me, when the Messianic kingdom comes, We'll see exactly, you know, why all of our uh, the things that we saw as tragedy and, and and things that were horrible, and that we only can see that way from our vantage point. Um, you know, now that that you know, God will wipe away, as it says in the Book of Revelation, and it says also, I think, in the Book of Isaiah, if I'm not mistaken, you know, God will wipe away every tear. And you know, no eye has seen, no you know thought, you know mind has thought about what it will be like in that day. And you know, so I've also heard the idea that there will be no more questions. You know, in this world, there's um, you know a lot of questions and no answers. But in the world to come, there's answers, but there's no more questions because then we fully uh, you know see as as Hashem sees, etc. So, anyways, um, without. Uh, back to the reason why we would read the book of Echa, 
um, the Book of Lamentations is, you know, I really want to go ahead and make this virtual kolel or learning together, um, you know, a, a time when we're very based on, on Mikra, on scripture. And the reason I want to base um, our time on learning together on Mikra, what's known as Mikra in the collection of, of, uh, of Hebrew texts and things like that, uh, referred to as Mikra, the, 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 the uh, written word, well, that's actually two, uh, it's a different word, but Mikra basically is the word that's talked about the, in terms of scripture as opposed to things that are oral and orally passed down, and et cetera. Um, that basically, I want to go ahead and deal with learning Mikra because why? Because those people, um, because those people who have uh, recognized who our Messiah is, those who call themselves followers of Yeshua, um, basically, you know, the texts that we have from our sages are very heavily reliant on, you know, quoting from the Tanakh. And so I think it's our job and it's incumbent upon us to be um, <clears throat> really, really rooted and grounded in Mikra. And so either way, whether we end up reading the book of Echa this year, and obviously if we end up reading it, it will be a good introduction for um, those of you who are going to be reading through it or be at a public reading, um, you know, on the, the 9th of Av, which falls on a Saturday night this year. And so, God willing, you know, we won't be reading it because, again, we'll have been redeemed through Mashiach. But just in case, um, you know, we'll go ahead and read it together. And also just to ga gain fluency in both Hebrew, etc. you know, a bunch of different things. So without further ado, what I want to do today is basically probably just spend, you know, the remainder of our time together going over, um, you know, some introduction and background. And so um, let's see here. I think this is what I want to share with you guys. Let's see if I can do this without going crazy right here. Ah, looks like I can. Okay, wonderful. So whatever was happening previously has worked itself out, and now we don't have the uh, this this crazy uh, inception looking <laughs> the inception looking. Uh, um, uh, effect that happens. So um, I wanted to go ahead and point your attention right here to yutor.org. Okay. And um, hopefully this is what you guys are seeing. Yep. Looks, looks good here. And um, yutor.org and Rabbi Yitzhak Echelom. And as you can see here, he has a, a series on Megillah, on the Megillat uh, Echa. Yeah, I'm not sure why this is showing up here, but uh, let's go ahead and put that down. There we go. And, um, you know, so I was listening listening to this in preparation for our talks together. Um, and there's some other, some other sources that I think would be good for you to listen to. Uh, I included some of them in... Um, I included some of them in the description on Virtual Colo. You can go ahead and see some of the sources there. And let's see, I'm gonna try and get a little fancy and uh, have another camera here so you can see me um, even while I, there we go. And looks like it's gonna work. <laughs> so, um, but the the other place that I wanted to, wanted to go ahead and show you the, um, is in Sfaria. This, this, um, uh, this website, Safaria, it's a really great website. A friend of mine actually almost worked for them. Um, and, you know, they're a um, nonprofit organization, from what I understand. And they're um, user supported, meaning that they put the call out there to, you know, all of the users to help them, um, you know, do community translations. Um, and so they've translated a tremendous amount of Jewish texts. And so this is what, what we're going to be using. Um, I think it's really probably the best site out there to go ahead and access Jewish texts, etc. And the reason why is because, as you can see here, there's the Hebrew and the English. But then if I click on this this like little number one right here, and I should probably make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, so what it does, let me go ahead and make that a little bit smaller. Okay. What it does is I can go ahead and hit connections right here and it'll give me all the different connections 
um, that basically have to do with this verse right here, verse chap chapter one of Eicha, uh, verse one. And you can see all the way from, you know, uh, mystical literature, the Tikkun Zohar, you know, Midrashic literature. And, you know, we'll just go ahead and look at just a really, you know, quickly point here. And you see that O is in Hebrew, but actually if you look down as far as I think I'm correct here, with this, yeah, and so with this particular midrash, it's also translated into English. And you know, we'll actually look at this midrash in just a quick second here. Um, so not everything is translated, but just to point that out. Um, let's see here. Did I want to look at something else over here? Um, no, it's just I think pulling up the same thing. Um, what I did want to look at is I want to go to go ahead and go back here, to go to connections. And I wanted to go ahead and turn this guy off right here to put this to only Hebrew. And um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well here. Um, so let's go ahead and go to, and I can turn this guy off as well. Yeah, I guess you can see it okay here. Um, let's look at one more site here, which maybe we'll be able to, um, notice it a little bit better i don't know i'm not sure so there's another site <clears throat> known as mechon mamre it's a mamre institute is basically what it what that translates out to and um they also have you know an addition in you know they have hebrew text and things like that it's not as far far um you know Safari is far, far superior to the site, but it's also a really great site. It has a lot of different things, it has, um, you know, a lot of texts that are translated, etc. And so here are all the Megillots, here are all the different scrolls, and here's Eicha. And so what I wanted to do, sometimes it might, it, it just might be a little bit, mm, no, this isn't any clearer. So we'll just go back over here to um, to Safari. So one of the things I wanted to want to um, show you is is um, that Eicha is basically um, a chapter. It's basically a safer a book that's written in five chapters, and all of those chapters, except for chapter five, which we'll talk about in just just a moment, um, all have an an acrostic um, poetic structure where they're all written aleph to tav. So the first verse, as you can see here, is with an aleph, right? Echa. And then the second verse here, here is with a bait, bacho, right? And then you have a gimel and a dalet, and you keep going, uh, hey, and a vav, and a zayin. And it goes basically all the way like this. Now there's a little bit of intrigue, as we'll look a little bit later into, um, into, Let's see here. Let's we'll explain it a little bit later, I guess. But let's go ahead and look at look at it right now. Um, okay. So the question here is, is that I go from Samech, right? Sila, Sila Cho Abira Abirai, right? Um, and then I so the Samech being the being um, the uh, the word for sixty. Excuse me, the the letter for sixty, and then Ayin. Okay, Ayin being the letter for 70 and then pay being the letter for 80 so we're good right here however this ayin and pay gets switched in the some of the subsequent chapters so let's go ahead and take a look at that and let's go down to another chapter i don't know if i can do this yeah let's go ahead and go to bait uh, let's see here Um, so as you can see, by the way, just to take advantage of, uh, here we go. Um, just to go ahead and take advantage of, um, just looking at all this, you can look at, you know, just the text with the Nikud. You can go ahead and look at a translation. Um, and it, it gives you obviously the English translation. There's a JPS translator, translator, translation, which is the old 1917 one. Um, bunch of different translations here. I'm just going to go ahead and look at the plain text of the Nikud and, um, hopefully I'll be able to get to chapter two here. Okay, there's chapter one. Fine. And I don't know if I scroll down, uh, if it'll automatically populate to chapter two. 
and it does. Okay, perfect. So then here we're in chapter two, and again, we have the same, and this is a really cool learn, word that I learned, uh, a, uh, abecedarian. So a, abecedarian, A, B, C, D, um, that's an actual word, good for Scrabble, that kind of thing. So it's, it has this abecedarian um, you know, formula right here, where again, it goes through all of the Aleph baits, goes from Aleph to, Aleph to Tav, and I forget if it's the second chapter or a subsequent chapter, um, which we'll see in just a second here. Samech. Ah, yeah, here we go. So, Safku, uh, Alayich, that you should have a, um, a there should be a, um, a doubt upon you, and then Patsu Alayich, and then Asa Hashem. So here we have Samech, which is the, <clears throat> the letter for 60, um, and then we have pay, which is the letter for 80, and then ayin, which is the letter for 70. So you see this pay and this ayin are reversed. And if I were to go to chapter 3, it, we'd also see the same thing, etc. So we have this, this reversal. So that's part of the problem. Um, also, we have this a you know abecedarian formula as it is. So why would it be written like that? So let's talk a little bit about in terms of structure before we get into like, you know, look at history and things like that. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and shift over here um, just for ease of going back and forth. And in the Tanakh, there's basically, um, you know, different kinds of uh, different kinds of writings, different kinds of ketuvim um, or different kinds of genres, I guess is probably a better way to say it. Um, and one of the genres is called Safrut Chochma, um, the, the, um, the wisdom literature, if you will. Um, and usually that's uh, something that is um, uh, is is talked about in um, in Sifre Emet. So Sifre Emet is Aleph Mem Tav, and Aleph Mem Tav is Eov Job. Mem is Mishle uh, uh, Proverbs, and Tav is Tehillim. Uh, Psalms, and so in Sifre Emet, um, which is known as as uh, Safrut Chokma, the the books of uh, wisdom, so wisdom literature, um, basically uh, we can see this, you know, in a couple different places that there is this Abyssidarian type of idea here. And so let's just go ahead and we can look at a very famous one. We'll look at Mishle, um, just to go ahead and get started. Give me a second. I don't know. Ah, there it's going. And so if we look at Proverbs 31, you know, we have the Proverbs 31 woman, if you will. And so then what we do is uh, from verse 10, verse Yud, we have Aleph and Beit and Gimel and Dalit and Hay and Vav and Zion, etc. So here's this Ibisidarian um, uh, formula. So then uh, if we go back and we look at um, some of the chapters in Tehillim, you know, very famously, obviously, we have the chapter that we say, you know, multiple times a day, three times a day in our prayers. Um, every single day is is the chapter uh, Psalm 145. And let's see if I can get to it quickly here. There we go. Uh, Psalm 145, known as Ashrei. Okay, but it's actually not necessarily Ashrei. Ashrei are two different verses, uh, one from Psalm 88, one from Psalm 84, that we go ahead and, you know, put before we go to Psalm 145. But nonetheless, you can see, you know, Aromimcha Elokai HaMelech, you know, I will I will lift my my Lord up, my Lord the King up, Bechoyom um, um every day I will bless you, Gadol Hashem Umehulam Ma'id, um, Hashem is great and his praise is, is a mighty or is, he has great praise. Um, and so this is another, again, Abyssidarian formula. And then if we go to Psalm 34, um, we see the same thing here. Psalm 34, which we say in Shabbat and holidays. Um, and so here we have, you know, Abarecha het Hashem, Bahashem Tihalel. Tit Halel Nafshi Gadlula Shamiti Dirashti and then etc. Um, so this Abyssidarian formula is you know comes up all over the place, and so you know part of the problem then with our structure is why do we have this I in it and pay um, mix up, and so it's obviously you know something that 
it, you know, the, the sages knew about and had a formula for, you know, how the Aleph Bet went. And so why, why the mix up? So there's a couple different ideas. The first idea is, is that um, perhaps, and if we look historically, um, you know, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the first uh, idea I have is a boring idea, at least boring to me. Um, you know, I, I, we when we fo found texts at the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, from what I understand from Rabbi Echelum Shear um, that I was listening to, he was basically saying that we found a lot of um, uh, alpha, alpha beta charts. And there were charts, basically, there were scribes practicing writing the, the Aleph Beit. And that actually, it showed that there were some um, letters that were mixed up. And now it could have been, obviously, that, you know, they were learning, whatever it is. Or it also could have been that the the structure to the Aleph Beit wasn't necessary to the, to the, um, to the, um, what am I looking for, to the, to the alphabet, uh, alphabet, there we go, there's the word in English, <laughs> that the structure to the alphabet wasn't already set. So that could be some, that could be one of the reasons, we don't know. Um, you know, another idea is, is that perhaps um, that, you know, that there's there was a difference um, in terms of opinions, in terms of like how to set the alphabet, uh, uh, and that wasn't set until a little bit later. Um, there's also a midrashic understanding, and the midrashic understanding goes into a little bit of, of the historical setting for um, for the Book of Echa. So it's probably a good good point right now um, to go there. I did want to say one other thing though before we do that. So I wanted to go ahead and look at Echa. Just to look at a little bit more of the structure, and here I want to go ahead and look at um, what what the Ta'ameha Mikra, which are called the the notes of reading. And so basically, this is with um, you know kind of the the melody, the chanting, if you will. And so most verses basically in the Tanakh go the they they go this way. They say um, you know whatever happened, and then there's something called Netnachta. Um, let me go ahead and make this a lot bigger here so I can point this out and maybe it's a little too big but um, you get the idea here so here's the Ednachta right here this kind of almost wishbone looking um, uh, cancellation mark so this is a melody mark right there that's a that's a musical note and you know just tells the reader basically um, to go ahead and take a pause and so basically what that means is that typically um, this is breaking up of the verse and breaking up the verse in terms of different halves so you could say it's almost kind of like a semicolon or you know a common a conjunction breaking up you know two parts um, two complete sentences connecting them together to make a compound sentence um, now there are some places where you have a complex sentence not to get all grammarian on you but where you have you know a fragment of a sentence and a comma and it's connected to a larger complete sentence so there are some places where there is an adachta where basically the verse is not broken in half is what i guess i'm meaning to say however let's go back over here to and uh, let me go ahead and go back to a tanakh that has mikra tameha mikra tanakh version i should say and let's see here, where can I do that? Um, that's with the Nikud. Give me a second, just I'm gonna put myself down here a little bit. And yeah, Im Tameha Mikra, here we go. And so now I'm you know, I'm going to a version of Tanakh with the Tameha Mikra, with the cancellation notes. And if I go to Tehillim, and let's just go to like you know a very famous, um, again you know a very famous uh, verse here. Uh, let's go to our chapter, Psalm one forty five. And if I can find it, it's going to be over here somewhere. There we go, Psalm one forty five. And again, this is typically referred to as the Ashrei uh, Psalm, even though that's not exactly what it is. But either Adomimcha Elokai Hamelech, Ve'avadachashim Chal Olam Vaed. So you see that basically it goes, you know, da 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 da
da -da 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 -da. and so basically the idea of what I'm kind of uh, you know trying to show you is there's a meter and the meter and um, you know not only is the structure you know being an acrostic structure with Aleph and Gimel uh, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, etc um, but also there's a structure that goes um, that goes along with a meter, and that's very important in Hebraic poetry. So, rhyme, um, as maybe uh, you might know in, you know, in English, is something that's very important important in English poetry. Um, however, rhyme is not something that's necessarily um, alluded or used in he Hebraic poetry. It's more so, um, again, you know, the structure of things, and again. Um, how the verses are structured in terms of meter. But then we get to Echa, and Echa basically, as you can see, here's a little bit of a longer verse, and it's structured um, pretty much where there's a little bit of an imbalance. Um, again, you know, looking at this verse right here, same kind of thing. We have the Ethnachta, hopefully you can just either see this right here where I'm pointing or just, you know, take my word for it, um, you know, that it's imbalanced, you know, and and so the idea here is, is that, you know, is Echa, is it necessarily poetry? Well, kind of. Um, it's kind of poetry in the sense that it's not necessarily meant for beautification. It's actually um, something that's meant, you know, for a lament. And um, so they call Echa, actually Echa is historically... Um, all the way up until, you know, the 8th century is not even called Echa in terms of uh, rabbinic literature. It's actually it's actually called Kinot. And a Kina is something that's known as the elegy in, in English. Um, again, I have to translate the English. <laughs> you know, an elegy kind of like a dirge, kind of like, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, when we think of poetry in terms of things that are rhyming and things that are that are um, clever or that are aesthetically pleasing either, um, you know, to listen to or sometimes even to look at, um, but it's more so, you know, kind of something that's um, sad and, and meant to communicate, you know, some kind of lament or mourning or something like that. And so the reason why then Echa doesn't have this, this same kind of meter is you know that it's obviously meant to be off balance. It's meant to show that things are not in order and things are not the way that they should be. Um, they're off balance, and also you know just the traditional melody that's used um, is something that's you know very haunting. You know, Echa Yeshabadahad Ayihirabatiyahan Ayisahak Almando. You know, so it's just like. Um, you know, it's something that's just like very, it's, it's like a, a haunting melody. It's something that might be very, you know, kind of ironically beautiful, but it's definitely in a tone where it's like everything is just like in a, in, in a lower a tone and, you know, meant to kind of bring you down, if you will. Um, so that's a little bit about the structure of Echa. And um, I wanted to go ahead and look at just a little bit about um, some of the background of Echa. So one of the best places to start is just actually with Rashi. And so let's go ahead and we'll start with Rashi. And by the way, so let me show you what happens here with how Safari is structured. So you have this little Aleph right here. And I just have the Aleph because it's all in Hebrew. So if I can just switch it, I can even just change it all to English. And then if I click these dots right here, That'll open this up, and then I can connect. I can click connections, and connections would be all the different connections right here, as you see. And I'm going to go ahead and click it to Hebrew English. So this is a really powerful website, as you see. And if I click the one, and then again the connections over here, and I'm just going to look at the Rashi. So Rashi basically he starts off looking at the the. Uh, the beginning um, opening words of his commentary, Echa Yushva Badad. So alas, the, the city, you know, sits by itself uh, alone. And so here he goes into a little bit of the background. So I wanted to go ahead and use this as a jumping off point um, to talk more about the background of Echa. So he says, Yermiahu Ketav Sefer Kinot. And so you see, even in Rashi's um, 
you know, Rashi's time, he calls it safe, uh, safer keynote. He, he calls it the book of um, dirges or elegies or kind of almost the book of lamentations, which might be, um, you know, a better translation or excuse me, a better name for the book um, than the, than what we um, currently call it in modern uh, time, Eicha. Uh, so safer keynote, Taya Hamigila Asher Saraf, Yehoyakim, and uh, well, here, let's go ahead and pause up to this point. And so, what is he saying? So, he's alluding to down here in English um, Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. It is a, the scroll that Jehoiakim um, Jehoiakim burned on the hearth that was on the fire. So, we'll talk about that in just a quick moment. Um, we'll look at a little bit more expansive. Understanding of this, and there were in it shalosh aleph aleph beitot. There were three ver, three chapters. Um, there were a abyssidarian formula, echa yeshva yeshava, echa ya yaiv, um, echa yoam, um, shuv haosif alav. Ani hagever, um, shuhu al shuhu shalosh aleph beitot shne um. Uh, Shneemar and Yirmiyahu, the old Nasofa lehem the Divarim Rabim Kehema Shalosh Keneged Shalosh. And so let's go ahead and look at the translation. He says, There was in it three acrostics. Oh, how he remained, um, how covered with the cloud, and how um, be, become dim. And then again, added to it, I am the man. So um, that is the three acrostics as it is stated, and yet it was added to the to them many words such as those, um, which is Jeremiah says, uh, which is what Jeremiah says right there. And so basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to go ahead and look at, um, so he's alluding to the book of Jeremiah here, and Jeremiah traditionally is understood to be the author, and he's also alluding to chapter 36. So I wanted to go ahead and take a look at chapter 36 here, and let's look at some of the, um, you know, some of the, and we'll just, we'll just get into English here for just ease of reading it really quickly. And so um, I wanted to go ahead and back up and look a little bit at the context here. Um, give me a moment. Okay. Surely thus says the Lord concerning King of Jehoiakim of Judah, he shall not have any of his lines sitting on the throne of David and his own corpse shall be left exposed to the heat by day and the cold by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his courtiers for their iniquity. I will bring on them and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all the men of Judah, um, all the disasters which I have warned them, but they should not listen. Now all the disasters which I've warned them, um, you know, this refers back to, um, oh, don't know what happened there. Oh, I see. It's it's now going ahead and expanding from Jeremiah. Um, all the disasters which I warn them, um, you know, goes to the to the chokhmaot. I guess I mean to chachot. Um, so the tachachot or tachacha is a rebuke, and the, so the sections of rebuke. So one of the sections of rebuke is in the end of um, Parshat Bahar which is in chapter 26 or 27 of Leviticus. I can't remember which one. And there's another one that's, I think, chapter 27, 28, something like that, um, at the, towards the end of Parshat Um uh, No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, Parshat Bechu Kotai um, is the one that's in Leviticus. And in uh, Deuteronomy, it's, uh, let's see, I think it's Parshat... No, it's not Parsha Torah A. I can't remember exactly the Parsha. But anyways, it's about uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27, 28, 20, something like that, something in there. Um, you have um, the the Tachachot, you have the um, rebukes. And so this is, you know, obviously what I think Jeremiah is referring to right here. Um, so Jeremiah got another scroll and gave it, and gave it to the scribe Baruch, son of Neriah. And at Jeremiah's dictation, he wrote it in the whole text of the scroll that King Jehoiakim of Judah had burned. And more of that, uh, more of the like was added. So again, the idea here um, is that this is a reference to um, 
Um, this is a reference to what was written, the scroll of rebuke, and the scroll of rebuke understood midrashically and understood uh, <clears throat> in other ways is that of Echa. So I wanted to go ahead and show you another source that I use a lot, um, that I get a lot of, um, you know, just um, edification for my own, and then also, you know, anytime I'm learning, you know, this is one of the sources <clears throat> that I go to, you know, to go ahead and draw and glean some wisdom. And that's OU.org. So OU.org, and it's pulling up right now. Hopefully it's going to be pulling up correctly on your screen as well. Let's see here. And, yep, looks like it's pulled up right there. Perfect. Um, so OU.org is really cool because they have um, this thing called you know, Nach Yomi. Nach uh, is... Um, is an acrostic of Nevi'im and Ketuvim. And so that's Nach. And Nach is basically everything that's not the Torah. So it's the prophets and the writings. And so they have, you know, every single chapter, as you can see, is, um, um, has two parts to it. It has one, it has a, <clears throat> excuse me, an audio um, class or, you know, review of it. And then also it has, as you can see here, this written review. And so I wanted to go ahead and just read through the written review with you. It's written by um, a lot of different people. Here, this one is Rabbi Jack Abramowitz, and it's a really good um, review. So I just wanted to kind of go through it with you a little bit, and then uh, we'll end up talking about some other some other quick things here um, related to actually this week in Parashat Shlach. Echa and Lamentations uh, is an unusual book. As you are probably aware, the book describes the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, and it is read on Tisha B'Av, the ninth above, the date dedicated to commemorating that sorrowful event. What well, many may find surprising, however, is that the book was actually written prophetically as a warning in anticipation of the destruction. So actually, according to the stages, according to the understanding that um, you know, we saw just in, in Jeremiah chapter 36, that that scroll that was burned by, by Melech Jehoiakim, um, King Jehoiakim, um, was the original book of Echa, uh, Echa, of Lamentations, and then it was rewritten again afterwards, um, you know, at, um, you know, Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, Prophet Jeremiah's dictation, and it was added to, so the, that's probably where either chapter four was added, as you can see, the chapter four is a little bit different, or perhaps chapter five, we're not exactly sure. And so he, we, um, he says in chapter 36 of Jeremiah, the prophet was instructed to write the scroll of, as a warning to King Jehoiakim. Uh, Jeremiah's student Baruch read the scroll to the king who had it destroyed. There's some discussion as, as to whether the scroll contained the, uh, just the first chapter of the book or perhaps chapters 1, 2, and 4. Um, I'm sorry, you know, I meant to say 1, 2, and 4 because chapter 3, when we get to UC, is really an autobiographical chapter. So it's, um, you know, really whoever was involved in the destruction um, basically is writing it autobiographically. But in any event, it contained the pres the essence of Echa. The other chapters were added later when the book was re recopied. Echa is also mentioned in Second Chronicles 35, 25, which describes Jeremiah mourning over King Josiah. Jeremiah laments that Jerusalem, once so full of life, is now desolate. And that's what we get, you know, um, you know, so um, that uh, how is the city that sits so desolate, which was once, you know, um, once a full city is now like a widow. Um, you know, so that's the imagery that's used in the first set, first verse of chapter chapter one, um, and you know that's what he says right here. Jer Jer Jerusalem, formerly a major world power, is now subservient to the other nations. Jerusalem weeps over the destruction and exile, um, but there is no one to comfort her, as former allies are now enemies. The nation of Judah was driven into exile for their sins. They were forced into other lands where they found no rest. The roads to Jerusalem are overgrown because of the lack of traffic. The Jews used to come to the temple regularly for the festivals, but no longer. The Kohanim mourned the, dis the discontinuation of the temple sacrifices, temple services rather. Uh, the young women mourn as does Jerusalem herself. 
the enemies of the Jewish people were permitted to conquer the nation. Um, the former relaxed while the children of the latter were are taken away into captivity. The city has lost all her splendor. Her princes were weakened like deer, unable to find a place to gaze. Accordingly, they fled without strength in the face of the enemy. Jerusalem recounts um, the her misfortunes, remembering, quote-unquote, the good old days. But the people fell into the hands of the enemy, and there was no one to save them. The enemies gloated over Jerusalem's downfall. All this happened to Jerusalem because of the sins of the inhabitants. Those who used to admire Jerusalem now despise her because they have seen her, they have seen her shame. Uh, Jerusalem herself sighs and turns away because of her misfortunes. The uncleanliness of Jerusalem can be seen on her skirts. Rashi points out that the metaphor here is obviously menstrual blood. All this has happened, and you can imagine the, you know, shame and, uh, you know, the shame of, uh, you know, a woman menstruating in and having it shown in her clothing. All this has happened because the people acted without considering the consequences of their deeds. Um, they asked God to see their sorry state under the heel of their haughty conquerors. Um, the enemy forces forces looted the silver and gold. The nations of Ammon and Moab burned the Torah scrolls because it was written there that the men of these nations um, may not marry into the Jewish people. The Jews have um, heaved heavy sighs as they searched for bread. They traded all their riches for food to survive. The Jews warn uh, the nations that see them in this state, in this state, not to let this happen in them, since there is no pain comparable to that which God has sent them in ang His anger. God sent fire from heaven, which shattered their bones. Um, he caught their feet in a net. He turned them back around and made them swoon. The yoke of their sins was marked in God's hand, quote-unquote. There were so many sins all intertwined that he that the weight of them on the nation's neck was too heavy to bear, and they fell before their enemies. God trampled all the warriors of Israel <clears throat> and called the enemy to crush them. He stumped on the women and girls like grapes in a wine vat. All this is why Jerusalem weeps. Again, very, very tragic and sad, you know, kind of imagery, etc. Um, let's go ahead and look down to the next. Jerusalem calls for help, but there's no one to come to her aid because God has decreed that the Jewish people would be an outcast surrounded by enemies. Um, God is righteous and the nation has earned his, this punishment for disobeying his word. And if you think about it, you know, God doesn't owe, owe any of us um, mercy. And that's actually why it's called mercy. <laughs> you know, chesed, it's something, uh, you know, rachamim, it's something that's kindness. It's a kindness that's done to somebody. It's as if, you know, I owe you a debt and then you forgive the debt. Well, you don't have to do that. You know, the idea is, is that I owe you the money and you should receive the money. You know, there's no... Uh, obligation that you have to give me any kindness. And so this, again, is just kind of the opposite of, you know, focusing on God's tremendous mercy. This is just fo focusing on God's tremendous justice and how it's meted out to people. And, you know, it's talked about in a very, um, you know, very poetic um, terminology. And then again, it's a really sad, depressing book. Um, but however, you know, we want to go ahead and go through it, um, not only to have um, some preparation in terms of um, entering into um, the, the period of destruction, you know, especially after the first of Av, which is coming upon us soon, um, in about uh, it's look, uh, next week, exactly, it looks like. Um, but also, um, or I should say a week or so. Um, but also just to enter into um, uh, our Father's heart and also um, our Messiah's heart. And we'll talk about that in, a, in a, just a little bit here. Jerusalem mourns to God from her distress. She laments that that which has occurred due to the sins of the inhabitants, she has no allies and her enemies rejoice in her downfall. God said this day would come and it has. If only it, it had happened to the enemy instead. May God make note of their sins and treat them like he did Israel. And then he ends off the last, the very last paragraph here talking about the first four chapters of Echa, her um, alphabetic acrostic, acrostics, with the third being a triple acrostic. Yeah, so each one of the verses here, each one of the chapters, um, so chapter Perak Aleph, chapter 1, has 22 verses. Perak Beit has 22 verses. Perak Gimel, chapter 3, actually has 66 verses. And so basically it's three different 22-letter um, uh, uh, 
excuse me, 22 verse acrostics. I'm going through all the 22 verses. Now they're very short. Um, so it's, it doesn't really take up much more real estate than chapters one, two, or four. Um, but just to, you know, kind of show you that that's kind of almost like the penultimate chapter. You know, you have chapters one and two on this side, chapters four and five on this side. So again, it draws um, to the middle. Um, and you will note that the three chapters that contain simple acrostics are the same as those that some opinions feel constitute the the contents of Jeremiah's original scroll. So, you know, that's just something I wanted to go ahead and uh, mention to you guys. The the next, the, the last thing I wanted to go ahead and go over is really this, this idea here. Oh, let me go ahead and move myself down here. Um, and that's the, that's the idea of the historical origin. And this is definitely on the Midrashic level, the historical origin of the book of Echa. And so historically, even before there was a city, even before there was a temple, a city of Jerusalem and, and a temple in Jerusalem, um, there was the idea, there was the idea of the land. And so that actually comes up in this um, week's Torah portion, Parshat Shlach, and, you know, where Shlach meaning, uh, you know, um, um, you know, Shlach, uh, Shlach Lecha Lefanim, Shlach Lecha Anashim Lefanecha, I think is how the verse goes. And um, hold on, let me second here. I'm just going ahead and making sure I can pull this up. So, anyway, so the idea, you know, you pretty much know the story that uh, Moses sends out men, and it's a, it doesn't say the Ragel, it doesn't say to uh, a Meragel, I should say, it doesn't say to spy out the land. Um, but it actually says to um, the tour to basically take a tour. So the word in Hebrew and English are pretty much the same word. Um, just to go ahead and, and survey the land, uh, you know, might be a good um, a good way to look at it. Instead, what happens is ten of the spies come back with an evil report, and then the whole nation weeps and etc. So there are a couple different um, uh, there are a couple different um, commentaries that I wanted to go ahead and set you up with. So one is from H.com, and I'm not exactly sure why I'm having such a trouble going looking there, but let's go ahead and go over to um, Y.U. Torah. So Y.U. Torah, um, also down here, Rabbi Echelon, has another really great, um, really great Sha'ira, um, talking about relating the sin of the spies, quote unquote, and Tishabav. And so that's, you know, just right here, obviously dealing with Parshat Shlach, and I wanted to go, hopefully I can get to this h.com website, this article. Okay, so maybe I need to close down, close this down here and, you know, just open it in a new tab. Maybe that'll be helpful. Not exactly sure what's happening with my Chrome browser, but, you know, whatever. Um, so basically what happens is, is that, you know, all the spies come back and they go and they look at the they look at the land, and they come back and they give an evil report, and the people um, are crying and weeping and, so, and such. Okay, here we go. And you know, it describes the famous story of the twelve spies, one from each tribe, etc. And let me go ahead and go down further here when I get there. When once it opens up further, further. And you know, so. Basically, this this um, article, you know, on the sin of the spies goes through, and you know, talks about the different aspects of, you know, what they saw there and things like that. Um, but then, you know, goes through, you know, all of the the quote unquote evil report, the negative report, um, you know, the sin of the spies. And so it goes through and it talks about, you know, after 40 days, the spies come back and 10 of them recommended against entering the land. They report, we can't succeed because everything is huge. A reference to the uh, gigantic, gigantic fruits. We can't succeed because the land devours its inhabitants. A reference to the funeral, which is talked about up there. And we can't succeed because it's too strong. A, a reference to the heavily fortified walls. And so... Um, the Israelite community accepts the report and gives up their dream of going to Israel. The consequence, if you don't enter, if you don't want to enter the land, God says, says God, then you won't enter the land. And, you know, so, and in chapter 14, verse 1, let's go ahead and go there um, and let's take a look here. 
let's go back to Safari and I wanted to show you kind of how easy this is to navigate um, by the way and um, give me just a quick moment and I wanted to go ahead and look at um, Rashi's commentary on chapter 14 verse 1 so let's go ahead and navigate there together and you know I could close out some of these some of these texts here some of these sites and so basically there's a bunch of different there's a couple of different ways you can just look at the parsha so that's what i'll do here and so it auto populates the parsha that we're on and so let's go ahead and go down to chapter 14 verse 1 and it's having a hard time doing that sorry my browser is probably just not the greatest here I think I just have too many things going on at the same time. All right. I can, ah, here we go. Okay, so now it's working correctly. Uh, and then that's what I wanted. I wanted to go ahead and go down to where it says that they were weeping. Uh, oh, it doesn't use the word weep, maybe it uses the word cry. here all right anyway so let's just go down to chapter 14 verse 1 we'll see i'm interested to see what the word is that they use here and i pauses again for just the slowness of the browser and everything like that so hopefully you can see it okay on your end and so you know chapter 13 basically um goes through goes through everything here um, you know, in terms of everything that's going on. And then, yeah, we get to chapter 14, verse 1, which hopefully I'll get to up here. Give me just a quick moment. Okay. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, oh, man, I'm having such a hard time navigating through this. Uh, okay, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the speak to the Israeli people and say to them when you enter the land that I'm giving you to settle in uh, and would present an uh, offering. Um, you know, maybe this isn't exactly the verse that we're looking for, but the idea here, again, um, you know, going back to this, to that site, and you know what, let's go ahead and we'll just go ahead and um, end up back together. Here, I'll go ahead and, you know, stop the sharing on my screen and we'll just look back here together at, whoops, together at this, there we go. Um, so the idea here, though, is, is that, um, you know, basically it says, and there's a midrash and it was, you can look at it in the Rashi that I was trying to show you, but anyways, my screen, I had too many things going on here from my computer, so it was going too slow and too choppy. So anyways, the idea though is, is that, you know, when B'nai Yisrael, when they, when they cry and weep, you know, to God, you know, God says, you know, look, you want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. And so basically he decrees that, um, that there will be a destruction of the temple. And we'll look at that verse or that, that Midrash, I should say, rather. We'll look at the Midrash a little bit tomorrow. I'll go ahead and make sure it's all prepared for you and everything like that. Um, but the historical source, at least according to the sages in the, in the Gemara, in the, in the Talmud, um, and if you want to look it up, by the way, on your, on your own, it's, uh, it's Tractate Sanhedrin, and it's page um, Kuf, Dalet, Kuf Dalet Beit, um, Ahmed Beit, it's a uh, page, it's Ahmed Kufdalit, I'm sorry, and it's uh, side bait, uh, um, side two, side B. And um, so Sanhedrin chapter, page 104, side B, 104B. And you can look and it talks about it and interprets that section right there as being the historical source for Tisha B'Av, that the people basically um, didn't want to enter into the land even from the beginning. And so that. Um, you know, uh, and it's, it's basically there's a, there's a principle that was introduced into reading the text by Nachmanides, um, the Rambam. It says um, it says Masa Avot Simen Labani. So the 
the actions of the fathers are a sign for the children. And so it's kind of seen as it's like, well, our four, our forefathers, you know, our ancestors, they didn't even want to go into the land in the first place. And so, yeah, so maybe this land isn't such a great land. And then you have the diaspora, you have um, Jews moving outside of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is, is that there was a degradation for the land of the land and a disregard of the land. And so, you know, all the way back from the beginning before the land even was given to the Israelite people, um, to the Jewish people. And so therefore it's seen as the source for Tisha B'Av. And so we'll look at that a little bit tomorrow, but the, but I wanted to end up just having a, you know, a quick word about why we're going through all this. So we're going through all this because, you know, our master, um, our Messiah, basically when he came and when he saw that um, Israel in mass was not heeding his call to repentance, um, it was not looking and not recognizing that Malchut was was soon was soon to come. Basically, um, you know, he wept. It says he wept and he mourned over Jerusalem, but he also became the prophet of the second temple destruction, much like Jeremiah was the prophet of the first temple's destruction. And he basically said, you know, in one generation that the temple was going to be destroyed, and that's exactly what happened. And, um, you know, so the, the, the things that trouble our master, the trouble Yeshua, should be the things that trouble us. And we should be troubled that you know of course obviously we are we recognize we recognize who the messiah is and all the advantageous things that he's done for us in terms of giving us a way of life in terms of um you know taking our sins upon him etc however there's there's still a major gap between the way that things are and the way that things should be and you know it's behooves us to recognize that and so i think you know in order to enter into those things that you know that the the gap between you know how things sh how things are and how things should be you know we need to go ahead and recognize that that was something that troubled our master and so it should trouble us as well so um so therefore i think it's you know something that's very it's an important time to go ahead and to enter into the month of uh the month of av and into the three weeks that precede the month of Av. And we'll talk about that as we get closer to that. And we have some ideas about what we're going to be doing to help prepare here at Virtual Kolal um, for that. But again, you know, this is something that troubled, troubled our master. So it's something that should trouble us. And so um, even though it's a very depressing, sad book to read, um, I want to go ahead and review this with you guys. Excuse me. To go ahead and to enter into the same kind of sorrow that our master has over our people and the state of our people and the state of the world, really. So God willing, though, to end on a positive note, God willing, you know, we'll just, this will just be an academic exercise for us because God willing, we'll have the Bivya Samashiach, the, the coming of the, our Messiah speedily soon in our days and before the month of Av even maybe. And, uh, you know, definitely before Tisha B'Av and that, God willing, Tisha B'Av this year can be a holiday for us. So thank you all so much for learning um, today with me. This is Yisrael Levitt for Virtual Kolo coming from uh, over here in Beth Emanuel in Hudson, Wisconsin. Until tomorrow morning, have a great day in every way.